you know who are you, what is your nature, and what is your gain. All living being, that means say mundane soul, became pure soul. I bless them. Sarve Pisukina Santu, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhagani Vaishantu, Ma Kasti Dukma Niya. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, this is Kirti. I have to turn my video off because the video was coming choppy. So um, um, I will move on to the next presentation. Um, uh, I've been conveyed that we are very tight on time. Uh, Acharya Kanaknandi Ji Maharaj has moaned and therefore he would not be taking any questions this evening or morning in, in case of US. Um, so we'll move on to the next present, presentation that is uh, uh, Hello. Dr. Kalyan Gangwal. Hello, uh, just just a minute. Uh, I am sitting next to Achar Kanakandi ji and Achar, she will definitely take the questions and he informed me that the uh, disciple of Acharya Kanak Nandiji, like Narayan Lal Kachara, Professor Chakravarti Dev Kumar, Dr. Surendra Kumar Ji Pokharna, Chamlal Ji Godavat, and Ram Gopal Ji and Parasmal Agrawar. He will answer the questions asked to Acharya Kanak Nandiji. And if you want, then Acharya Kanak Nandiji will himself answer your questions on 22nd March morning session. That is 7 p.m. before India. Thank you. Let's do that since uh, we are running tight on time as well. So it will be awesome if, if that can be done tomorrow, that is 22nd. I'll, uh, I've, I've been conveyed that we are very tight on time and there will be no more questions until the end of all the presentations. With that, I shall move on to um, introduction of Dr. Kalyan Gangwal. Dr. Gangwal is a physician by trade, but quite a visionary physician at that. More importantly, he is also a social thinker. Above all, he is completely selfless social worker. He's a strict observer of many ethical principles of Jainism. As a result of that, for past 20 years, he's been campaigning to end cattle sacrifice to the gods. And for the last 40 years, he's been a strong advocate for ethics, vegetarianism, and anti-addiction effort. Not just that, he has been inspiration for more than 4 million non-vegetarians to become vegetarian. I must say, when I read that, I was trying to think very quickly, doing a mental calculation as to how many Gangwals would it take for the whole world to become vegetarian. Um, I'm not sure there is a second Gangwal, but with that said, I'm sure you all have heard that a healthy mind resides in a healthy body. And perhaps also the age old aphorism you are what you eat. In the same context, I'm also reminded of the motto from my alma mater, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which said, Sharir Madhyam Khalu Dharma Sadhanam. I'm also reminded of someone reminding us yesterday that body is nothing without soul, but also what would soul do without body? How do you get rid of karmas without having a healthy body? Well, my friends, Dr. Gangwal is going to enlighten us on all these related topics. So Dr. Gangwal, your answer. Please unmute yourself.
Siddharth? Yes. Omkara Bindu Sanyuktam Nityam Jayanti Yoginaha Kamadam Mokshadam Chaiva Omkara Yanamo Namaha All organizers of this conference, Kirti Jain, and all viewers, Sabhiko Jajanendra, Jajanendra to all, and Trivar Namostu to Kanak Nandiji Mahamuriraj Acharya Kanak. Nakdanjiji, Mahamiraj, Trivarna Mostu, Trivarna Mostu. Well, I am a doctor, I am a physician, I am a cardiologist, attached to the two different hospitals in Pune, and now very busy because the COVID is rampant in Pune like mad. And whole day I am spending my time with my son, Dr. Paritosh Kangwal, in serving the all COVID patients and attending the hospitals. When I was invited for this talk, I was surprised because I am not a Jain scholar, neither I am a researcher, but I am a grassroots worker for the last 50 years. I am 76 now, but work for the last 40 years, 50 years now for animal rights, stopping the sacrifices in front of the god and goddesses and propagating the vegetarianism all over the world and taking part in the different medical conferences because I'm a postgraduate teacher in medicine, teaching the MD and DNB students also. So in the international congresses, my topics are related to the Jainism. It may be the Ratri Bhojan Tyag, not eating after sunset, even observing the Choyar, stopping all the Pori Ahar after the sunset, or even de-addiction and vegetarianism and the importance of the vegetarianism. I do remember a very important thing when I was invited to talk on a consciousness and so old, I was surprised. I was surprised to know that even a medical conscious, even a medical faculties now are talking about the existence of the soul. Though the Western, even as a student, medical student, I was told that the existence of the school was denied. So exist soul and a body. And our Jain religion always teaches us to know the Bheda Vijnan in the sense body is different than the soul. But the soul resides in the body and so healthy body is a house of a soul. And to keep the body healthy, it is a very, very important aspect which has been talked about in Jainism for years together, for ages, for ages. Now, what is after all health? Health is defined by the WHO is a obedient state of well-being, not only physical, but mental and social too. But all the time, I do remember the conference in uh, Boston, where a German scientist came on the store, doctor came on the stage and said that your physical health is not important. Your medical health and mental health is not important. Your social health is not important. The most important part of your health is your spiritual health. And that is exactly the teaching that Jainism has given to the rest of the world, that spiritual health is a most important part of your health and not only physical and mental health. So how to keep this physical health? Well, this is not only the Jain religion, but even the Vedic Dhammas, even all the religions which have been propagated or started in our country, India, they have given the same message. In a Bhagavad Gita, in a Bhagavad Gita also, the Krishna, tells Arjuna that yukta ahara viharasya, yuktaha karmasya cheshtasu, yuktaha swapnava bodhasya, yogo bhavadhukkaha. In the sense, unless you take the right diet, you cannot enjoy the happiness in the life. And yukta ahar, yukta vihar, yukta thinking, all that is all important. And that is exactly the Jainism has taught us for years together. The most principal of our foundation of Jainism is Ahinsa, Ahinsa, Ahinsa. And that's the reason when I, as a physician, I look at this topic, even the Chandogya Upanishad, if you look at the Chandogya Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad also says that the, what is a Moksha Marga? Ahara Shuddhi, Sattva Shuddhi, Sattva Shuddhi Dhruva Smruti, Smruti Labhe Sarvagranti Naha Moksha Vipadaha. 
इन द सेंस मोक्ष मार्ग भी आहार से जाता है यानी your diet is a most important thing even though you are walking on the path of moksha moksha and that is the reason why the all the world is now turning on the what is called as sattvic ahar what is called as rajas ahar and what is a talk about tamas ahar this has been discussed in jainism our ahar our shravaka achar samant bhadra acharya or other acharyas are talking us about this diet which is very very important part of our life and if you want to have a pure soul your diet has to be pure you can't talk about spirituality when you have a stick of chicken in your hand you can't talk about ahimsa when you are non vegetarian so this is exactly the thoughts has to be propagated i do remember a episode where the dalai lama had come in pune for a world religious congress and when i found that in the lunch break he was not taking the lunch with us because it was in the sadhu aswani's mission we were all together sadhu aswani just pointed out that dalai lama is taking the food in another room and we found that he was taking a non vegetarian food yak food because when we discussed about this we were shocked and that is the reason why after that we talked about this issue with the dalai lama and told him that you can't talk about non violence when you are not observing the non violence in your diet so today in this all spiritual congresses we have to be very very particular when we talk about spirituality the spirituality foundation is your diet is your diet and is your diet as a researcher as a researcher in the field of medicine we have done a lot of research to prove that our whole human body is made for only vegetarian diet and not the non vegetarian diet here is not a platform to highlight this issue but as a medical doctor i will certainly say that this thought is going all over the world is going all over the world and today is a corona period in the corona period also we have been able to propagate the vegetarianism on a very large extent and i am very happy to tell you one of my colleagues from shanghai is telling me just last week that large number of the chinese people are turning vegetarian after the corona outbreak why because all the diseases are coming from the animal and when meat eating habit is one of the major source of these all viruses whether it is spanish flu whether it is hong kong flu whether it is ebola whether it is sars all these that diseases have been come by the viruses which are primary sources definitely animal so i always always in all the congresses always tell us tell the people that the meat is a murder you can't have the meat unless you murder the animal and murdering the animal is when you are talking about soul you are talking about a spirituality how can you carry on with this sort of a behavior so it, it is the time where the large world community is turning vegetarian and as a jains we have our duty to be a ambassador for vegetarianism and propagate the vegetarianism on a large extent i am very happy to tell you that even by repeated repeated lectures by re repeated brainwashing or repeated you know, talks on vegetarianism in the medical educated community we have turned out large number of the non vegetarian people to the vegetarianism and i think this is ahimsa when we are talking about soul western people do not believe that the animals have a soul even they don't believe they kill them they slaughter them thinking that they don't have a consciousness but this is a only religion in the world the jainism which has said that well ekendriya se panchendriya jeev all having a five senses of organ well they are definitely at a level of consciousness why we are now jains are talking about prithvi kai jeev jal kai jeev and even agni kai jeev which has been now accepted in the western world and the researchers that a gel water has also a memory water has also have a memory this has been talked to us by the jain acharyas and our tirthankaras thousand and thousand years ago which has been getting proved by the western sciences and the scientific world it is not a jagdish chandra basu who said the plants are living organism we are treating them we have talking about this our jain acharya even a tatvartha sutra samant vatra acharya pujya pad all other acharyas of jain 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 acharyas have expressed this thought for years and years together and thousand years back 
So at this contest, in this contest where people are talking about a, a soul and a consciousness, I would like to highlight here even Kumud Nanti Acharya Ji, Pokarna Ji, and even a spiritual a previous speaker has highlighted this issue, but as a scholar or whatever little uh, Jain studies that I have done, I am very proud to tell you, I am a Kattar Shavaka. I observe the Shavak Dharma. I observe the Choyar. I have taken the Brahmacharya Vrat 20 years back from Acharya Vidya Sagarji Muhammad Raj, and I am observing this. And even at the age of 76, I can work for 18 hours just for last few almost months. Day and night, we are myself and my son, Dr. Paritosh, who are working for a COVID patients day and night. This is exactly the religiality which is definitely reflected in your day-to-day -day behavior, your consciousness, your mind, your thoughts, everything can change when you observe, observe the religious dharmas, dharmas. Here, I would like to tell you the soul and the consciousness, they are, people are confusing that they are one and the same, but as a researcher, I would like to tell you the art soul is a different and consciousness is a reflection of the soul, reflection of the soul. The Atma soul has got many other shaktis about which Pokanaji was expressing. These all energies and the shaktis Atma have, one of the energy is, is consciousness. And this consciousness is reflected as a doctor. Many times I get surprised when I talk, I see the dying patients, that time my religion, my knowledge of Agama, that helps me quite a lot. Many times we find when the dying person, dying person, because we know that our Jain philosophy says that at that moment, we call as a Samudghat, what is called a Maranantic Samudghat, the soul leaves the, this body, goes to the next place where he's going to be born, and then he, he comes back to the this body, we have seen this happening in number of times in dying individuals. Medically, they are looking like die death because there's no heart, there's no, no breathing, the pupils are not reacting. But even after five or ten minutes, they become conscious and they start speaking something which is unusual. When I heard just last month that patient getting medical, my resident were telling that he's dead. He's, he's not conscious, he's unco not only unconscious, but he's dead. But after 10 minutes of that, the man, man back got conscious. He started talking and he said, well, I don't want to become a, a, the sewer. I don't want to become the pig. I want to become a cow. I want to become a cow. I was surprised, even many residents were surprised why he's saying so. And that I realized that Samudghat, for Vednantik Samudghat, Marnantik Samudghat, all these things have been described are the scientific realities, scientific realities. And as a doctor, I have realized this as a this thing. As a propagator of the vegetarianism, I would like to tell you that, well, vegetarian is diet is the only diet which is going to keep you healthy. And this has been discussed in all the doctor's conferences, whether it's a conference on the cancer or whether it is a conference in the, or the heart disease, all the doctor consultants are now promoting the vegetarian diet, which has been promoted or talked about by the Jain Acharyas for thousands and thousands of years. Even today, we are, as a doctor, I, I all, all appeal, because there are a number of uh, attendants attending these conferences. I would request them to change their behavior, change their food habits, and see the change that they can have, the see the change they can have in their conscious level, in their day-to-day -day activity and in their activities becoming ahinsak, ahinsak, ahinsak. Your vegetarianism will change your mind. It has been proved beyond doubt by the medical science that what you eat, who are, you are what you eat. And this is jaise khave an, vaisa hoga man, jaise pive pani, vaisi hogi vani, is not the old age distinct, uh, but it is a reality as we doctor, we know our neurotransmitters in the brain, which controls our emotions and everything, are, are the result of our diet. Our diet, if it's sattvic, if you are taking a non-violent non food, if you are taking the ahinsa diet, then your all neurotransmitters are also going to change. And that is the reason why it is said, yadrishe bhakshate annam 
तद्रशे जायते मति दीपो भक्ष तिधांतम कज्जलम प्रस्यते इन द सेंस इफ यू आर ईटिंग द जैसे इट्स अ रूपक दिया गया है उसमें यह कहा गया है अंधेरा खाता है दीपक इसलिए काजल ही उगलता है काजल ही उगलता है इसीलिए एज ए डॉक्टर के नाते मैं यही कहूंगा एज अ प्रोपोगेटर ऑफ वेजिटेनिज्म प्रोपोगेटर ऑफ अहिंसा एंड आई एम वेरी वेरी हैप्पी टू टेल यू दैट आई डू यू रिमेंबर द एपिसोड वेन इन विज्ञान भवन आई वॉज फेलिसिटेड बाय अब्दुल कलाम अवर पास पास प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ इंडिया हु वॉज अ वेजिटेरियन इवन ही वॉज अ मुस्लिम बट ही वॉज अ वेजिटेरियन वेन आई आस हिम अ क्वेश्चन दैट यू हैव इन्वेंटेड सो मेनी वेपन्स इन इसरो what is the what is the best weapon you you dream of and he said there are only two weapons which have been given by the jainism to the rest rest of the world one is satya and the second is ahimsa and that's the reason these are the two weapons which are going to change the universe they are going to change the universe and as a doctor all these conferences whatever we are holding in different parts of the country different parts of the world we should try to propagate non violence and non violence in diet is a vegetarian diet vegetarian diet i also congratulate all the organization organizers to calling me a very a small person as way is a social worker grassroots worker for this conference i was really i was not knowing what message should i give but i i thought that well even this is a conference in consciousness and atma well purity of the soul purity of consciousness and all your sense organs will definitely be altered by your pure diet your satvik diet and that is a vegetarian diet it is a wrong concept which has been best put up in our mind in the westerners that a vegetarian food is a second class protein vegetarian diet vegetarian proteins are second class and uh, non vegetarian protein are first class there is no classification ever exist now in the modern science all the nutritionist all over the world are now talking about vegetarianism and we get all the possible nutrition nutrients in our diet even including the b12 and even vitamin d about which the people are talking too much i want to tell you on this plat international platform that the normal values for indian of a b12 are much lower than the western population because our diet habits are different and whatever the milk we take whatever the diet we are vegetarian diet also we take we get adequate vitamin d and b12 so this is a wrong concept which has been imbibed in our minds of the medical doctors also so as a doctor as a physician as a shravak and as a follower of acharya vidya sagar uh, muni shri praman sagar ji i always appeal all the people all the ajain peoples also to turn into vegetarianism and they appreciate that even after changing the food habits for 15 days or one month there's a dramatic change in their behavior their behavior their emotions and the family members come and tell us well whole thing has become a very cool and peaceful in our atmosphere in the family also and that's the reason i do tell you that in the pune we propagate vegetarianism in the muslim community also i had number of talks in the masjid also on vegetarianism not directly vegetarianism ahara vigyan i am telling the people uh, in pune we have anjuman islamic vegetarian society where there are not less than 6000 members who are muslim members they are vegetarian and they don't kill the bakri on a bakri eat in the sense they don't yeah, right. the bakri also on the bakri eat so what we need is that to change the society change the society be an ambassador of vegetarianism be the ambassador of non violence be an ambassador to propagate the message of our tirthankaras propagate the messages of our acharyas who had a great vision great vision and we want to talk on a moksha marga we have to change our food habits we have thank to change food we have to change our food habits i thank you very much kirti ji and also jain ji and all the organizer to a small person like me they gave me a platform a international platform to share my thoughts with you people as a physician because i am not a scholar i am not a very great scientist not a researcher but a grassroots social worker grassroots social worker grassroots social worker jai wonderful jai and uh, wonderful jai and, jai and passionate jai. presentation thank you so much ahimsa parma dharma ki jai 
we shall um, thank you again very passionate i i truly appreciate that um, we shall uh, move on to the next presentation as uh, we're going to be keeping all the questions for the end um, our next presenter is uh, dr christopher chapel who really needs no introduction every time i say that i'm reminded of uh, dean deepak jain who would uh, who would have said to me kirti i need no introduction but that doesn't mean i don't want an introduction with that said i will introduce dr chapel he is the doshi professor of indic and comparative theology as well as the founding director of the master of arts in yoga studies at loyola marymount university in los angeles he's written several books on the history and philosophy of yoga and at the intersection of religion and ecology he serves as an advisor to a number of organizations including the forum on religion and ecology at the prestigious yale university the jain study center at soas or school of oriental and african studies in london the international school of jain studies new delhi and the himsa center i think his serving as an advisor to these prestigious organizations alone says something about how important a place he bears in the area of academic jain studies he's going to talk about conscience that is the our a person's moral sense of right and wrong and how that sense relates to consciousness its interplay between conscience and consciousness i present to you ladies and gentlemen dr christopher chapel judge anandra it's an honor to be with you all kirti jain it's so good to see you again and i wanted to give acknowledgement to muni mahendra who has been with us and he taught me priksha dhyan back in 1989 in ladnu so i'm going to share my screen um from the beginning and i'm going to ask you to switch out many of us have been sitting for a very long period of time so if you could just stretch your arms up and let your body sway and just acknowledge that the life that we live has so many capacities and i want to draw our attention first to the aesthetic the beautiful many people when they see the acharanga sutra the oldest extant jain text see a sternness but read it again take another look because this text is about beauty this text shows mahavira bhagavan mahavira imploring people as they look at trees not to see trees for your their utility not to see trees as potential tables or buckets not to see trees as something to be burned for warmth but to see trees for their beauty for their symmetry for their magnificence in this image i photographed at the iit station of the delhi metro and it calls our attention to those teachings in the acharanga sutra that elemental beings possess awareness and we heard earlier about morphic fields we heard earlier about bioelectrical impulses we heard earlier about how consciousness is not about brains we know from the word bhava itself that our existence vibrates at a very subtle level 
And to the extent that our sattva is able to become the predominant mode or guna within this bhava of our life, we come to appreciate that beauty matters. Paying attention to the magnificence of the sunrise, paying attention to the arrival of the monsoon, paying attention to all of the refinement that comes with the power of darshan calls us to elevate our emplacement within the universe. Now, once one sees, has that samyak dirshti, has that moment of awareness that all of the world, whether we can see it or not see it, that all of the world is suffused with life. Jain Shravaks, Jain Samans and Samanis, Sadhus and Sadvis seek to minimize all harm. And on the one hand, as we've heard, no compromise is to be made vis-a-vis -vis lifestyle, vis-a-vis -vis diet. But nonetheless, what we see here with these giant nuns in Ramtek is communicated as a place of calm, a place of energy, and a place not of bliss or glee, but a place of abiding equanimity and a place as we read about it in the Bhagavad Gita again, of karma yoga, of doing what needs to be done. Now this doing what needs to be done involves giving honor to the beauty that can be observed. And one of the ways of this path is to tell stories. And I won't go into all of the details, but there was a prince who became an elephant and an elephant who knew how to protect others by going to the lake during a forest fire and whose own life in that incarnation was interrupted due to his commitment to protect a rabbit. And this whole narrative, this very beautiful story, requires seeing the connections made between the tiniest forms of life, which are right now in Pune and Mumbai, so powerful the coronavirus, Nagoda is taking the lives of so many. And this mandala shows the truth as articulated in Tavarta Sutra. In each of these different colored triangles represent a different chapter of the Tavarta Sutra, and from that knowledge, that biological knowledge that we receive in texts such as the Tavarta, such as the Acharanga Sutra, and so many more, we learn of the importance of honoring and respecting life as large as an elephant and life as tiny as a Nagoda. With this attunement of the human soul to the presence of life all around, we arrive at a place of knowing, a way of knowing, an epistemology, an awareness, a chetana, that indicates our capacity to be conscious, 
to be aware, to be mindful of the following. Our mind governs the outflow of our senses. Our mind governs the outflow of our senses. And in common with Sankhya and with what we see in Abhidharma Buddhism, Jain thinkers wrote extensive treatises about the relationship between karmic impulses or prakritis and how one engages the world. Now, this photograph was taken at the Green Park Temple in South Delhi during Paryushan in 2019, when I was living in Haskas. And if we look carefully at this, we see so much activity. People performing puja, people honoring the very possibility of freedom and people through the visit to the temple and through participation in the fasting, working to cleanse the prakritis, working to cleanse the kashayas that obstruct the best of human potential. So with this awareness comes con so a science that is a connected science. And this is our conscience. Our self-awareness, our awareness of the presence of the self leads to this process known Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian educator, called this process conscientization. And our prior speaker brought us to remembrance of the terror inflicted by factory farming. And by developing the insightful awakening spoken in the phrase, just like me, one cultivates a compassionate heart. And these people performing Puja and Baragon, east of Delhi, are remembering in their Puja performance the soul, wherever it takes shape, has the same awareness as do I. And this brings our conscience to an even greater level. And because of this affinity with all beings, we feel our shortcomings ever more acutely. Machami Dukadam, forgive me for any transgression intended or not intended. This is in Hastinapur. And if you've not been, please visit. It's a remarkable piece of architecture that takes the body on a journey upward through darkness, circuit after circuit of circuit after circuit, when finally you land in this beautiful place where your whole body, having ascended to the heights of this magnificent temple, brings one to remembrance that we must always honor the best possible. And through sadhana, perform daily, perhaps a visit to a temple, perhaps a daily meditation, pranayama, yoga practice, perhaps a twice monthly fast, for me, a weekly fast, perhaps seasonal recognition, recognition, such as Diwali, and then the yearly purification that we find, Paryushan, which comes at the same time every year, more or less, as Yom Kippur in Jewish tradition. Okay, all of this 
remembrance allows one to reflect upon offenses committed. And through doing Pranikramana, which in the Jesuit Catholic tradition is called the examine, there is a checking in. What did I do today? What could I have done better? And I have a reading group that's working with a text, a beautiful text called the Yoga Bindu, composed by Haribhadra Virahanka some 1500 years ago. And he, in this text, reminds us of the importance of fasting. He reminds us of why we do puja, why we perform japa. He reminds us of the quality of dim memory that pushes through in terms of remembering past lives, not as recreation, but remembering past lives for the purpose of deeper self-understanding. The morphic field memory that we heard of from Rupert Sheldrake, all of this designed to increase purification, whether called shuva or shudha. And I wanted to uh, remind us this again, another image from Hastinapur of yogis performing the sorts of purification that disaggregate the fascia of the body from the memories grounded in kashaya and purify and release the fascia in the body so there can be a free flow and a connecting with the more suffic aspect of our being, of our soul. And I wanted to um, give us a little bit of a glimpse of a meditation first described in the Gyanarnava of Shubhachandra and then repeated verbatim and the Yoga Shastra of Hemachandra. And invite us, I know we've been sitting a long time, so just sort of lift up your bottom a little bit if you're on a chair or whatever, but feel the earthiness of your body. Just touch your face, touch your knees. And by reciting lum, there's an invocation of the earth within our body. And then there's a request to visualize whatever kashaya has afflicted one, whether egoism or pride or whatever it may have been, and to visualize it being offered up in flame. Visualize it being incinerated, if you will, enchanting the mantra of rum and visualizing the color red. And then following this to breathe vigorously. And with the mantra yum, invite the internal monsoon, invite the cleansing rains, the element of water to cleanse us through perhaps our tears of emotion, perhaps through perspiration of the energy, the virya that we manifest. And to use the mantra of wam, 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 and to visualize this whiteness that comes through the performance of sadhana. And then finally to move into that realm of spaciousness move into our approximate glimpse through Samyak Dershti into the Siddha Loka, what it means to be free. And in this exercise, we have ascended the Purusha Loka 
And for perhaps just a minute, or perhaps as long as 48 minutes, we find that regathering of connection with self, yoga, and disconnection from karma, ah, yoga. Culmination is found in Gyanarnava, lands us in a place, the final line here, this meditation makes one similar to the jinnah who crossed the great water to the other shore. And these images, again from Ramtek, Kayot Sarga, standing tall, free from the taint of karma. I want to close with the implications. And we've heard about direct action and diet, Professor Fancioni as well. We've heard many allusions to the importance of making correct consumer choices. And we see evidence of these teachings becoming increasingly interesting to young people. There's a rejuvenation of diction in India during the past 50 years. There's global advocacy of vegetarianism and veganism. And there's this powerful awareness of climate change, a commitment to renewable energy, and consider this new habit at India Institute of Science, IIT and Technology in Delhi, in New Delhi, where no more plastic bottles, plastic choking the ocean. We find water and glass fully recyclable, an honoring of life in the simplest of activities. So I appreciate the opportunity to share and urge us all as we move forward to be very careful in every action that we undertake to do what we can in order to minimize human greed and make space for what is truly needful in the world, a commitment to empathy, a commitment to daily, weekly, seasonal, yearly, purification, and a commitment to an ongoing lifestyle grounded in satya and ahimsa. Judge Nendra. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. As always, a superb talk. Thank you. Since uh, we continue to run a little tight on time, we are saving the questions for the end. Um, I shall move on to uh, our next presentation, which is from a bright young scholar, Brian Donaldson. Brian is an assistant professor in religious studies and philosophy at the, endowed, the newly endowed Sri Parshanath Presidential Chair in Jain Studies at the University of California, Irvine. She joined UCI from Rice University in Houston, where she was a Bhagwan Mahavir Chao Family Foundation postdoctoral fellow in Jain studies. She's also taught philosophy and religious studies with an emphasis on applied ethics and South Asian slash Indian traditions at Claremont School of Theology and Manmat College. She's an author and editor of several publications. Her interest 
She's interested in how individuals and societies make ethical choices about who and what is included in the community of concern. What inherited truths, whether they're scientific, religious, or secular, inform our ideas of who should be protected and who is expendable? What logic are at work to justify the marginalization of certain people, animals, or habitats? And how do these ideas change? Through a talk today, that's titled The Role of Consciousness in Jain Response to Darwin, that is the Darwin's evolution. She's going to explore some of these ideas. Here is Vyan. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Kertiji, uh, Jai Janendra, and uh, greetings from Southern California. I'm really glad to be with you all. The thoughts I want to share with you today are part of a longer chapter that I wrote for a book titled Asian Religious Responses to Darwinism. My task in that chapter was to assess Jain views on Darwinian evolution, including those written by Jain studies scholars, as well as articles written by and for Jains. In the wider article, I explore how authors attempt to engage a modern theory of evolution within Jain cosmology, which has certain antithetical features, such as the earth being a flat disk in its cosmology or the Jain concept of cyclical time characterized by gradual decay and restoration. Primarily, I explore three strategic arguments that these authors have made for the Jain tradition's compatibility with Darwin's theory of evolution. Namely, that the Jain view posits biological resonances and epistemic flexibility, the evolution of consciousness through karmic variation, and uh, third, the exceptional possibility of human omniscience. In light of the conference theme, I'm gonna just touch briefly on the first and focus most on the second and third. So in argument one, the Jain view posits biological resonances and epistemic flexibility. Because it describes a universe teeming with diverse life forms, Jain explanations of biology do offer resonances with modern accounts. Jain philosopher Nalini Joshi refers to these resonances as, quote, Darwinian expressions. And I identified three such expressions among authors. The first is affirming the pervasive life through the jeev. Second is analyzing interdependent and changing existence. And third is uh, giant accounts of diverse species struggling for survival. Authors who wrote about such expressions often strive to modify the giant tradition in ways to uh, resonate uh, with contemporary science, even as Joshi writes, quote, that it's not expected from the ancient texts to express modern theories in the same terms, concepts, and vocabulary, end quote. Thus, most authors use a degree of epistemic flexibility, meaning flexibility in their Jain knowledge framework, to find resonances with modern evolutionary biology. But let's turn to argument two to consider the role of consciousness within these resonances. The second set of Jain arguments emphasize the evolution of consciousness through karmic variation. The Jain doctrine of karma explains material evolution and bodily variation. And because this doctrine is so foreign to Darwin, it can't be generalized by authors as a mere Darwinian expression. Rather, authors have defended karma as a valid description of an implicit evolution of consciousness within Jeeves that must be considered as a necessary addition to Darwin's theory of variation through selection, right? So the first was a modification of giant uh, knowledge frameworks. And this perspective is that there's an addition that's needed. In this argument, karmic determinism is responsible for variations in consciousness. So in the giant tradition, karma, as you all probably have uh, discussed here, is understood as a kind of subtle matter that fills the universe. And I'm simplifying considerably, but it's enough for our purposes to say 
that not all matter is karmic, but that certain particles aggregate together and they become activated as karmic matter when jivas engage in passion-charged activities in the form of anger, pride, deceit, and greed. These activities charge the material aggregates such that they're said to stick to jivas like dirt upon a wet surface. Karmic matter is classified into two groups, destructive or ghatiya karma, which destroys the four qualities of jiv, namely consciousness or chaitanya with its two parts of knowledge and perception and energy and bliss. While an evolutionary view posits the gradual development of increasing, increasingly complex modes of cognition, Jain philosophy asserts that all living beings possess consciousness as the primary quality of jiv. These qualities of consciousness will differ as they're obscured more or less through karmic bondage. So according to Jain authors, karma is a primary factor in accounting for apparent differences of consciousness among living beings. The second kind of karma is non-destructive or aghatiya karma, which does not affect the jiv, but rather determines the kind of body and rebirth that jiv will experience. There are four uh, kinds uh, of karma that determine the birth state and the body shape, the length of jiv's embodied lives, whether a jiv's embodied environment will be conducive or not to the development of consciousness, and the degree of satisfaction or its lack that jeeves can attain in a certain environment. So just to summarize that, non-destructive karma accounts for bodily variation, while destructive karmas account for variations of consciousness as well as energy and bliss. The Jain path to liberation deal, details 14 gunasthans or the stages through which jeeves can gradually shed all destructive and non-destructive karmas. The Jain vows centered on nonviolence to self and others, along with practices such as fasting and meditation, enable progress along this 14 stage path toward either more auspicious rebirths, less obstructed consciousness, with the aim of ultimately shedding all karma to attain omniscience and liberation. The next aspect of this particular argument is that Nagodas give evidence of implicit karmic evolution of consciousness. Now, Darwin explains uh, what he calls laws of variation, such as inheritance, migration, response to climate, and disuse of certain attributes. But karma, because it works upon the body and the four qualities of the jiv, has been upheld by authors engaging Darwin's thought as a possible implicit theory of evolution. Padmanabh Jaini maps this implicit evolution through the nagoda, the simplest form of life in the Jain universe. Nagodas have only the single sense of touch, and unlike other one sense beings that possess a separate body, such as certain plants, Nagodas can only exist in clusters that live and die as a group, often upon host organisms, such as the skin of mammals or root vegetables, which is, of course, one of the explanation why uh, for giant diets that exclude uh, foods such as garlic, onions, and potatoes. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, Nagodas, those that have fallen back into the Nagoda state and those that for some reason have not yet left the Nagoda state called Nitya Nagoda. Um, that's what the Digambara Jains call it and the Avyavaharika by the Shvetambara. So I'm going to focus just on this second group, those that have not yet left the Nagoda state. Nitya Nagodas play a role in the Jain universe because they're the only infinite class of living beings. As Jeeves leave the, uni uh, the universe through liberation, which can only be atta attained in a five-sensed human body, one-sensed Jeeves uh, come into the world, according to Padmanabh Jaini's account, not as new life per se, but by differentiating themselves from their clusters. This emerging individuation maintains a finite population so that the universe doesn't run out of individual Jeeves. This replacement equation suggests that early Jains imagined, according to Jaini, that, quote, some souls begin their existence in a rather primordial and undifferentiated state, end quote, which could be inferred then for all souls. Adding this inference to the Jain doctrine that every soul exists along a continuum of consciousness, from the minimal trace of awareness possessed by the Nagoda to the omniscience of the Siddha, Jaini summarizes, quote, we have here a model which is both linear and evolutionary in its conception. 
J.C. Sikdar echoes this sentiment, suggesting that, quote, Jain Acharyas have worked out a theory of a sort of gradual evolving life forms on the basis of one sense organs from the Nagodas up to the five sensed animals and humans. Finally, in this argument, some authors suggest that Jain karma offers an alternative principle to Darwin's survival of the fittest through expanding consciousness. Survival of the fittest was a phrase that entered Darwin's fifth edition of On the Origin of Species in 1869 through the English biologist Herbert Spencer, who described the fittest as those in whom the most beneficial variations were preserved. Fitness is the mechanism in which tragedy and beauty meet for Darwin, whereas he writes, quote, from the war of nature evolve endless forms most beautiful, end quote. Darwin describes how the larva of parasitic wasps, for example, will feed within the living bodies of caterpillars as a gruesome variation, but yet one that serves the individual and its progeny. Jainism too asserts in the Acharanga Sutra that, quote, the living world is afflicted, miserable, difficult to instruct and without discrimination. Mahavir is said to say in that same text, quote, this is called the sansar, all beings experience individually pleasure and displeasure, pain, great terror and unhappiness. But authors who are engaging Jainism and Darwin did not take this diagnosis as the final word. Rudy Jansma, who's written on Jainism and evolution, asks, quote, would a Jain ever believe that utter self-interest of individuals or species, relentless struggle and cruelty are the only motivation powers in nature? End quote. Violence is not only a feature of evolution, according to Jansma's view, but it's a symptom of unenlightenment. Thus, some Jain authors see Darwin's model of competition and selection as responsible for destruction caused in the modern scientific era. Jain physicist Surendra Singh Pokhana, for example, ties biological competition to destructive technologies and developments that cause ecological damage. The error driving the competition model, according to these Jain authors, is that it lacks the goal of moksha and the stages of evolved consciousness to attain that end. Pokhana asserts that evolved consciousness generates a quote, live and let live alternative to survival of the fittest, revealing nonviolence or ahimsa to be the real factor driving evolution rather than natural selection. Ahimsa drives down chaos and the entropy of pollution and unchecked economic competition. Narayan Kachara, a giant mechanical engineer who recently authored a two volume set titled Scientific Explorations of the Jain Doctrine, suggests that the realization of ahimsa takes over as living beings acquire additional senses through advanced consciousness and rebirth. Quote, at the stage of five sensed organisms, natural selection might play only a marginal role, says Kachara, and it might have no role at all in the evolution of humans. Finally, argument three, and I'll finish with this, is the Jain view posits the possibility of human omniscience. Starting with the paradox of human exceptionalism, Humans in Jain cosmology are at once equal to all other living beings and also exceptional in the taxonomy of existence. They're equal in the possession of Jeev, in being subject to four different birth states, in having existed in innumerable bodily forms based on accumulated karma. But humans are exceptional since it's said that only five sensed humans and for the Digambara sect only male humans can achieve the fullest actualization of consciousness and reach liberation. As Joshi writes, between, quote, Darwin and the Jaina texts, both of them place human beings on the top of the creation, end quote. Now, I would say that whether on the top is the right image for Darwin's branching taxonomy, we can see here that there's something rare and special in being human in both of these narratives. Jain texts clearly assert that humans make up only a fraction of the 8.4 million possible birth states in the Tavarta Sutra. And attaining human form is understood to be difficult and the responsibility of gaining right worldview, right knowledge and right conduct places a special burden upon five sense creatures generally and humans in particular. Many scholars have argued that the equality of life through the Jeev is an exemplar for ecological flourishing and environmental reform. Yet others have pointed out that in orthodox Jain thought the more than human realm must be transcended as a prerequisite to liberation and ultimately that it even be destroyed in the time, uh, the time cycle of decline. 
The exceptionalism of human carnation, incarnation is only matched by the capacity of humans attaining omniscience in the 13th and 14th gunasthan. These stages signify the removal of all destructive karma that inhabits the four qualities of jiv, thereby allowing the full capacity to know all substances in the cosmos, as well as their qualities and changing modes simultaneously. Not only can humans pursue ever-growing knowledge in the Jain tradition, but the jinnas are actually said to have attained this state. Paul Dundas explains that, quote, the omniscient person as a type was for Jains totally trustworthy and faultless, against which the claims of other sects and schools were flawed and incomplete. The Jain position is essentially unfalsifiable, end quote. But contemporary writers take a slightly different route when it comes to Darwin. Authors have argued that extraordinary cognition skills, such as the memorization talents of Srimad Rajchandra, are underexplored by modern science. Also, some argue that feats such as extended fasting or meditation seem to defy current scientific explanations. Uh, the higher evolution of the mind is a phrase used by Rudy Jansma. He writes, quote, it could never even occur to the mind of a Darwinist, end quote. So even though the insights of the jinnas, namely the recorded teachings of Mahavir, cannot be scientifically verified, Jain authors engaging evolution still appear to consider these teachings authoritative. In the absence of empirical verification, these authors often appeal indirectly to omniscience through apophatic discourses, meaning what is unknown. In this case, the limits of scientific knowledge regarding the evolution of consciousness. Consciousness in Jeeves, both perception and knowledge, admits a much wider frame of data than modern science, according to this particular view of authors. Quote, scientific knowledge, according to Pokerna, is just a subset of a much wider concept of knowledge which is structured in the consciousness, end quote. So by establishing what Pokerna calls the limitations of the scientific methodology, end quote, Jain authors carve out new territory to explore ideas that modern science is not yet capable of considering, right? This is another perspective, looking at the unknown. Jain's working in scientific fields such as Pokerna and Surgeon Dilip Bopra hold open a possibility space for science to modify its own conclusions toward Jain ancient insights. This reversal puts the burden of verification on modern science rather than on Jainism. Pokerna and Bopra utilize Goodell's incompleteness theorem and mathematics to illuminate the limits of the scientific methods that would be enriched in their view with a more foundational concept of consciousness beyond the human only mind. The consciousness of the Jeev offers what these authors call a quote, new paradigm of systems theory to deal with these limitations and extend the current reaches of science. A Jain evolutionary theory, writes Jansma, quote, would not only be confined to the earth, but to the whole knowable universe, end quote, which encompasses, according to Pokerna, quote, quantum, uh, quantum consciousness, extrasensory perception, or hypercommunication and group consciousness, according to Narayan Kachara. From the angle of underexplored consciousness, Kachara writes, quote, the Darwinian revolution remains woefully incomplete uh, because many of us are still unwilling to abandon the comforting views that human consciousness is a predictable outcome, end quote. So consciousness in the Jain view far exceeds human only mind and offers, according to these authors, a new ground from which to understand the agency and activity of all life, which they see as currently stagnated in Darwin's notion of evolution. Thanks very much. Thank you, Brian. Speaking of, we are still saving the questions uh, for the last, but uh, speaking of Darwinian evolution, uh, there is one comment from Professor Pokhana that I'd like to, like to read. He says, uh, Professor Edward Goldsmith, a great ecologist has blamed the education of Darwin's principle as the main reason for many problems in the modern world. We should start teaching programs for live and let live. With that said, uh, we'll move on to our last presentation for the day. And that comes with the power of two. Um, the topic is consciousness 
a cross cultural and multidisciplinary engagement between James philosophy, analytic philosophy, and phenomenological philosophy of mind. I must say it took me a little while to try to understand the topic, but I'm sure Professor Vermeria would explain that in a little greater detail. So we have um, Professor Vermeria, uh, Billy Moria, uh, as well as Professor Vedya uh, together doing this presentation. I think in this case, uh, Purushottamji Billy Moria will do the presentation and uh, Anand Jay Prakash Vedya would take the questions. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce both of them very quickly. Professor Bill Moria is a Fulbright Nehru Scholar at Ashoka University and the India International Center in India. He's a Principal Fellow, Historical and Philosophical Studies at University of Melbourne, Australia. He's a Permanent Fellow at Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. He's also a distinguished senior fellow in Indian philosophy, the Center for Dharma Studies at the Graduate Technological, sorry, Theological Union at the University of California. He's editor in chief of Sophia, APA leader in diversification of philosophy, co-editor in chief of the Journal of Dharma Studies and principal investigator for the Indian philosophy Purushottama Lab at Rund University and the Federal Ministry of Science and Education in Moscow. The second collaborator, Professor Anand Jayaprakash Vedya, is a professor of philosophy at San Jose State University in California and has served as director of the Center for Comparative Philosophy. He works on consciousness, perception, critical thinking, and business ethics in both Anglo-analytic and Indo-analytic philosophy. For the past 10 years, he has strongly advocated for the inclusion of Indo-analytic philosophy in contemporary philosophical education across the globe. With respect to Jainism, he is especially interested in Jain theories of causation of the philosophy of mind and how Jain epistemology can contribute to social epistemology in a pluralistic and diverse global culture. With that, I will turn on the floor to Professor Bill Moria. Uh, thank you, um, Jay Jinendra. Um, I speak on behalf of uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Ananda Prakash Baidyar as well, and we're very grateful to be given the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, the topic has uh, changed somewhat, so if we could perhaps have the slides, I will speak to the slides. Great. Um, it's a much shorter topic than the longer one, it's more comprehensible, I think. Can the Jain theory of causation respond to uh, this philosopher, Korean philosopher uh, in America, uh, Jogwan Kim, his idea of causal exclusion argument? Now, uh, it will be explained that uh, the problem that's raised here is about the causal relation between mental states and um, <clears throat> brain states or physical states. Whether we can, uh, whether we can predicate consciousness on strongly on one side and weakly on another side, or whether there is there is a there is a, a correlation, a resonance, or even an identification of consciousness as yeah, you know, as a functional element or as a structural matter. So that will be explained as we go along. Uh, ne next slide, please. I have to say that each time, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, let's look at um, Kim's causal exclusion argument. So one, some events have mental causes because of the downward mental causation. Uh, every physical event has a sufficient physical cause because of closure, because it's a, it's a closed closed environment in a closed framework. Physical events, uh, events determine every mental event. This is the important part. Every mental event depends upon physical events because of supervenience. That's a sort of a relation of dependence that's been uh, 
that's being postulated here. So every physical event has a sufficient physical cause and every event is determined by and depends upon physical events because of sufficiency, sufficiency of argument, sufficiency of co causes rather. Uh, mental causes of behavior are distinct from physical causes of behavior from phenomenology of decision-making. However, no single event can have more than one sufficient cause occurring at any given time, unless it is a genuine cause of causal overdetermination because of causal exclusion. So it's a sort of a, a basically a, a, a physicalist argument that, that suggests that all our brains, all our, our mental states are really no more than physical states or brain states. So, you know, you don't have to sort of postulate any kind of consciousness or any kind of function beyond the physical. So the set of claims above, we want to say uh, inconsistent, uh, inconsistent, uh, therefore physicalism is wrong. But let's go further and, and, and show how Kim's argument works. According to Kim's diagram, P is sufficient cause of P prime, you see with the asterisk. But P necessitates the presence of M on top of P, ensuring that M is present to cause P prime. That's the line that runs from M to P. And M prime as well. So M prime, sort of like an abstract or an ideation or a percept. But according to causal exclusion, M prime plays no real causal role if P is sufficient to cause P prime. Do you, you see the argument? So, you know, we can, we can, we can almost we can exclude M's altogether in this in this context. All right. Okay. Next slide. So so how do we understand this causal uh, process? What kinds of causes are there? Well, here are some examples. About three or four. Facilitation versus production. Consider the tail of a fish produces the movement of the fish but the water facilitates the movement of the fish. See, there's not a real causal um, process. Nothing changes. It's just that the water facilitates the movement of the fish. Material versus efficient. Clay is the material cause of a given pot, but the potter is the efficient cause. So you see the real efficient cause is the, is the, is the person who's making the pot, the potter. So Kim's argument forces on productive or generation. There are other kinds of causal roles that mental states of consciousness can play with respect to physical causes or, or neural state, right? So, so you know, he, he will exclude, of course, the efficient cause or, or facilitation cause, but will only include the production cause. We're arguing for other kinds of causal relations. Next, please. Uh, so um, the tail of a fish produces the movement of the fish, but the water facilitates the movement of the fish. Perhaps mental states of consciousness facilitates physical states rather than producing them. On this model consciousness of model model of consciousness, consciousness is the neural state, uh, the way in which the water is to a fish, sort of neural, you could say even neutral. But consciousness is not specialized in the way water is. So perhaps a better analogy is that consciousness is to physical state in a way in which gravity is to objects that are subject to their force. So importantly, gravity like water is the facilitating cause of something rather than a pure productive cause. So when the apple falls, it's not actually changing anything in the apple as the field is having an impact and thereby the apple falls. Next slide, please. Uh, material versus efficient. So this is the clay is the material cause of a given part for the potter is efficient. Perhaps mental states of consciousness is the efficient cause of physical states rather than being the material cause. On this model, consciousness is to neural states the way in which the potter is to the clay that will become a pot. But consciousness is not specialized the way clay is. So perhaps a better analogy is that consciousness is to physical states the way in which gravity is to objects that are subject to forces. Importantly, Gravity, like the potter, is an efficient cause of something rather than a pure productive cause. Next slide, please. Uh, one more uh, 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 possibility. Percolation or filtration model. No, uh, steaming water passes through granules of crushed cocoa beans in a tray. This enables tiny particles of cocoa and caffeine to be carried to the middle chamber of the percolator. And that filtration pro 
process reduces the amount of particles going through and pumps out coffee into the mug, which stimulates the taste buds. Consciousness pervades, expands across the physical mental frame receptive to sensory data that is filtered into a cognitive experience. And we've heard from the previous um, presentations that consciousness is you know, it's not just confined to the biological or the physiological uh, frame, but it's rather more pervasive than that in, in the body as well. Uh, and it's you know, certainly in, in, in traditional theories, of consciousness, brain is not the center of consciousness. It could be the whole body or it could be even outside of the body epiphenomenally. So this is a hybrid causal process indirectly that gives rise to mental states, Paroksha Jnana. Next, next uh, uh, the example was drawn from Jeffrey Krepal. Uh, now this is the general the Pramana theory, mostly from Nyaya. Because you'll see that the direction in which our, 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 our cognitions are formed uh, from the object, it has a causal relation, has a, has a causal impact on our sensory data, on, on our sensory organs, whereby sensory information is sent. And then in our, in our mind, a percept or an image of that is formed. And then a judgment or more like a, a, a concept of the object um, is registered. So this is how the causal process is, is traced in Nyaya. Now cognition happening it's an episode or an event, it is often called, it's constituted in the mind or maybe part of the brain, but it's internal to consciousness like sense of time, but in images and concepts, hence a judgment. So perception, seeing a jar, touching a hand, smelling rose, for example, the jar is the internal to the structure of consciousness in this awareness state. So we have I plus cognition, so I'm seeing the jar, that's just how it develops. Next, next slide, please. Um, so here we, we sort of trace the, the general um, theory of, of cognition, which is, which is really basic to say that on the one side you have, uh, you have a cognition process, on the other side you have some logical conditions that require the, the cognition to be formed into a, a, proper, a proper judgment. And there is a causal, there is certainly a causal relation that is going on. And our attempt is to try and figure out what kind of causal relation is involved. How is it? That the mind forms the judgment that it forms, right? Now, of course, in, 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 the, in the Jain theory, as in, as in the Nyaya theory as well, consciousness is what facilitates, consciousness is what is in that sort of efficient or percolating or, or other senses rather than a, a direct physical causal relation that's happening. So the consciousness sent by the soul, by Atman, by Jeev, uh, lights up, lights up the, the percept, lights Okay. Okay. Next, uh, next slide. Sorry. All right. So this is how we um, we've, we've tried to sort of modify uh, Kim's theory and say, well, maybe this is how it works. Uh, so some part of this slide seems to be uh, missing at the bottom, right? So take M to be consciousness, right? Uh, P necessitates the presence of M. So when when a perception happens consciousness comes into, 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 into work, uh, ensuring that M is present to cause P prime. So we've got P prime on that side there, uh, as well as M prime, uh, namely, the, the, na namely the, the percept of the idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we read cause in the above senses, the, the previous slides that we saw, rather than a Newtonian billiard ball or a hard, hard causal terms, uh, and that applies to the 93 plus uh, namakarmas, then we have to surmise that P sufficiency hangs on the necessary presence and pervasion of M such that the arrow at P to, uh, at M to P will have pointers on both ends. So you can see how the pointers are changing now from M, you go to P prime, from M, you go to M uh, prime as well. So the causal dependence cuts deeply into non-physical, that is consciousness as implicative, while the mental, the conscious state remains to be supervenient on the physical. So on the one hand, we are saying, yes, the mental state is supervenient on the physical, right? But that is not the end of the story. The, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the buck does not stop there. It, it, it goes further into 
the, ne the necessity of consciousness facilitating that process hmm? or illuminating uh, using a Nyaya, uh, Nyaya term. Uh, it's uh, the, the luminosity is coming from somewhere other than just those physical states. Okay, so next slide, please. So, um, yeah, so invoking Siddhashana Divakar, um, this is how Shugan Jainji uh, describes the relationship. The physical body is a mechanical collection of a large number of interconnected material parts, primarily as 93 variants of Nama Karma with a cause and effect relation. So our task was to kind of figure out, well, other than the cause effect relation that's happening within the karmas themselves, within the body, within the, uh, within the kashyas, within all the things that have been accumulated, what happens in the case of the mental event, right? That was, that, that's a hard one. That's a hard, what uh, David Chalmers calls a hard problem. Uh, and, and here we try to find an answer within the Jain tradition. Each material part of the body is associated with its counter psychic part as well. Soul is coexistent with the body in its own, but soul is so far down, so, so, so way sort of, uh, 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 way, way in some ways, um, apopathically from, from the body that we have, to, we have to find the route through which it comes into, into, into mental activity. That then enables the interaction with the external and internal environments. It's the internal environment that we're more interested in here. So functioning of the material body is partly predictable like a mechanical clock across all places, but partly different like microscope, microprocessor based clocks in smartphones informed by background applications, the apps. They are just according to its detected location somewhere in the world mapped by disembodied Google satellite. So there's a kind of a, a, disembodied, uh, a, a disembodied field, if you like, which we describe as the, as the, as the, as the corroborate of mental events, which are responsible for ultimately the perception and the judgments that are formed. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion. We know that consciousness, Chaitanya, is believed to be an essential property of jiva, principle of sentience and the luminous source. The jiva in contact with the body gives rise to mental faculty, which is physical for all intents and purposes, but becomes luminous when triggered by an external stimulus and screen on tabula rasa. Tabula rasa meaning that, you know, sort of a, a blank, like a film, uh, the, the back of a film, uh, uh, back of a camera, the film part of it. Uh, so when it's when 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 a projection happens from the outside world into that part, a whole lot of activity begins to happen. And one of the activity that begins to happen is that consciousness is informed that there is something has come, uh, and 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 help 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 to decide what it is. Um, and so then an object is the image of an object is formed. Right. This process is functionally called the manas, right? It's, it's a functional thing rather than a structural thing itself. And that's what manas becomes. It's a functional thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there are several theories, functional theories of mind that are operating, but mostly that functionality is involved with the physical process rather than with any kind of phenomenologically uh, 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 embodied process that involves the a Cartesian mind, the mind that Descartes sort of thought was of a spirit thing. Well, we're suggesting that the mind is not that of a spirit thing. It is, it is very much a physical process, a neural set of processes. However, the properties of the mind, the qualia, such as color, acute, pain, hallucination, can be disembodied from the physical or presented as epiphenomenal. So it's only in terms of qualia, the qualities, rather than substances themselves, uh, the substance of the mind itself that, that, that are epiphenomenal, that are other than the physical, right? So Jain philosophy of mind rejects the rigid or mechanical causal model and instead prefers the explanatory model that is akin to the gravity field impact, water facilitating fish, cocoa infiltration coffee, and efficient cause process, especially in a panentheistic cosmological model rather than a creationist model. We don't need to go into, into the cosmological model here. That's been talked about quite a bit. So that is, uh, that is our, our conclusion. And I think this is sort of breaking some new ground on trying to understand uh, both the structure of, of, of mind and the function, more so the function of mind uh, in relation to consciousness in Jain theory. And I think I, if, if it's possible, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Vaidya to add uh, his, um, his, his, his bits and reflections 
uh, and clarification on just what's been presented. As, if that's possible, uh, Pooja Ji, that would be great. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes. I, go ahead, Dr. Okay. So yes, I think that the core idea that we're exploring can be put very simply like this. When you are deciding what to do, you deliberate in your mind and you're consciously aware of the process of reasoning through which you deliberate and make a decision about what you wanna do. So there's a causal process that's accessible in your consciousness that traces from thinking about what you wanna do, deciding what you wanna do, and then ultimately doing something with your physical body and your mind working with your physical body to do something. Yeguan Kim's argument tries to show that all of the mental stuff that you feel going on in your mind when you do that has no causal basis whatsoever in actually making your body move. This is why it's called the causal exclusion argument because the argument aims to show that mental states like deliberation, deciding, forming an intention, and then moving your body don't have a causal basis in making your body move. What we try to argue here is that there might be ideas about the nature of causation in Jainism and in other Indian philosophical traditions that can help us break the rigid model of thinking that it has to be only productive or generative causation. So Kim's argument works on the idea that mental causation and physical causation in the brain is only productive, but the model of facilitation, the model of efficient cause, and the model of percolation give a different picture of how mental states can relate to physical states in a non-productive way. So the goal is to show that within Indian philosophical traditions and perhaps in Jainism, there are models of causation that can help us understand how conscious mental states play a causal role, but maybe not a productive role. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vedia. If um, that, was, uh, that was fascinating. Uh, I'm sure there are questions from the audience. And if Dr. Iqbal allows, uh, we'll take some questions. Yes, um, you can. You have time. OK, excellent. Yeah. Uh, yes, you have 20 minutes. So, uh, yeah. Um, Ram Gopalji Jain uh, wanted to ask a question. If he's still here, he can unmute himself and ask the question. Jain Jain, Jain Jain. I'm Ram Gopal Jain. Go uh, ahead, sir. Yes, yes, we uh, can hear. Sir, uh, we have discussed about soul and consciousness. My question is, I am a how to attain some aggression? What is the way of it? What is the process of it? Okay. So his question is a broad one, and Samniji would answer that. Okay, how to Professor, attain some, Professor how to attain some aggression? Okay, Professor Chapin is answering. Yes, I think that Samyak Darshan is, of course, difficult to describe when it happens, and it's difficult to prepare for Samyak Darshan. But as with any religious experience, there can be preparation through sadhana to receive moments of insight. And that remains a little bit mysterious because it's the causality of it can never be a certain result from a certain behavior but one can prepare for the condition for what in some other religious language would be called the epiphany of Samyak Darshan, where you see things in that place of how they truly are. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just I can, I can add one thing uh, to the answer of uh, Professor uh, Chapel that uh, from uh, the point of view of the karmic philosophy, uh, if there is subsidence come, uh, destruction comes subsidence of eight, uh, seven types of uh, mohani karmic uh, uh, different uh, uh, prakritis, uh, then automatic you can get uh, some darshan. And there are certain uh, symptoms of uh, appearing some darshan in you. And that is the compassion, emotional control, 
and detachment, all these are different symptoms through which you can know that uh, yes, you are proceeding in that particular direction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So there's a question from uh, Professor uh, Shailendra Palvia. Where does the consciousness reside? <laughs> in the brain or in the soul? <laughs> okay, so to whom they are asking? He has a general question, uh, not uh, directed particularly at anybody. So whoever yeah. wants to take a shot. Well, yes. Well, I, 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 I think in the, in the Jain tradition, it's pretty clear that consciousness is, uh, I think as so, someone uh, in the talk mentioned, it's one of the Shaktis, uh, oh yes, uh, Acharya Ji had mentioned, it's one of the Shaktis of, uh, of what we translate as soul, but it's, it's probably more Atma than, you know, as a Jiva really basically. So it does not, um, consciousness, uh, is a property of, of the mind, but it is not an essence of the mind itself. So the essence of the mind, the essence of, the essence of consciousness is, is in the soul, in, in the Jain tradition. That's as far as I, I, I understand. And it is more active rather than inert. In the case of uh, Nyaya theory, consciousness is, uh, is inert until something happens, like, you know, a, a jar uh, is um, floats into one's awareness, or an attention is directed somewhere. Then consciousness comes into comes into effect. But I think in the Jain tradition, consciousness is ever active, ever alert, and ever attentive. Mm. Correct me if I am wrong, but that is my understanding. Uh, perfect answer. You have given the correct answer, which is a uh, really the concept of Jainism about consciousness. Okay, Manisha Shah has a question for uh, Dr. Brianna Donaldson. How can we highlight the positive strategies of animals and the environment in regard to the impact of survival and evolution, such as altruism, cooperation, and even nonviolence in the wild as a basis for survival and evolution? Dr. Donaldson, is she still mm -hmm. here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Shall I read it again? Um, no, I, I heard it. Yeah, I heard it. Thank you. Um, you know, I guess the, the aim that I was looking for in this um, paper was to present sort of the different ways that uh, Jain study scholars and Jain authors were, um, how did they bridge the, make a bridge between Jain thought and, um, and Darwinism. And I think one of the ways that uh, you heard in, um, that I tried to mention that speaks to this is that kind of uh, trying to challenge a concept of um, pure competition with a sense of um, not just uh, live and let live, but the sense that uh, different beings mm -hmm. are actually um, contributing and world shaping, right? And that uh, competition is only one mode of interacting, but not necessarily the most dominant. And uh, so uh, I, I think maybe personally in my work beyond that, um, I would say that I think one thing that is we really need, to, that we really run into as a challenge is just the inadequacy of metaphysical views that function within the secular uh, scientific and religious uh, frameworks. And so there's this, I, I think some various speakers have spoken to this, including Rupert Sheldrake earlier today, that uh, we would like to think that something like uh, that secularism or that science is somehow free of metaphysical claims, but they aren't. But because they don't want to speak about them, um, we can go on for you know decades upon decades without really challenging some of the fundamental assumptions, and so I think um, you know looking to metaphysics that are more adequate is really essential. Something that actually uh, offers a sense of dynamism, of agency, of the ways in which we are mutually constituted with other beings and through other beings, 
that these can be ways that we have to, that will fundamentally change the way that we're engaging with um, other living beings. And so that would be just a few thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Lakhaji wants to know if there's any difference between Chaitana and Chaitanya. I didn't think there was any, but experts, please. <laughs> No, oh, uh, there is no uh, difference actually. Uh, grammatically, we uh, uh, what we say we uh, form some uh, certain terminology in which we add some uh, suffix in the same meaning. So chetana and chetanya both are not uh, different in the sense. Uh, sometimes it is said that uh, chetana is found in which he is chetanya. So. Sometimes Chaitanya word stands for soul substance and Chaitanya is the attribute of soul. So that can also be way of understanding and mostly Chaitanya and Chaitanya both are uh, both stand for the attribute of uh, soul only and they are synonymous and interchangeable terms. So they are not different. Professor Srimal had his hands up. Um virtual hands. I'm not sure if he still has a question. Go ahead, please. I, I didn't see the virtual hand, but uh, go ahead. Whosoever has a question, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask. Professor Neptune. I don't have a hand up, hands up. I'm just listening and learning. Okay, sure. <laughs> Where did you see it? Okay, all right. We can go for some more questions. Yeah. Okay, so just uh, I want to say something if so, and there is no other question. Yes, there isn't one. Please go ahead. Sandeep. Okay, so in the context of uh, the presentation given by Professor Bilimora and uh, Vaidya, it is really very fascinating, very logical. And just uh, I want to say that uh, there are certain levels of our uh, uh, existence. Acharya Mahapragya has given seven levels in which we find that body is there, then uh, senses are there, then mind is there, then vital energy is there. And after that, it comes uh, lesha. So lesha is a very connecting, uh, it connecting uh, element uh, between soul, mind, thinking, and physical actions. So lesha has a very great role. If you could, uh, I would, provide you the full article uh, regarding these seven elements and how they are working and affecting each other and guiding uh, governing each other. So we have to just see that there is some connection between a physical action or body and soul. Just a direct soul cannot uh, affect uh, this physical body. There is in internal links in between the body and soul. So there are five other links which we have to understand. And if we, you could reflect on them, you can get quite a very uh, good answer to your question, which you are looking for, this particular presentation. So Lesha plays very great role in a spiritual evolution and also bringing the inner uh, conscious uh, directions or vibrations into physical action. Mm. Mm, th thank, thank you. So thank, thank, you. Um, thank you very much. I, I certainly look forward to the, um, yes. to the reference. Um, but I think um, you know the general tenor of our of our uh, of our um, attempt here is to get away from the very um, what, what I call the, the the billiard ball, the, the the kind of causation that David Hume had actually ended up rejecting anyway. That there is a you know a cause a direct cause effect relation between you. you hit, you hit the ball and it, you hit the cue, uh, the ball moves and the ball hits another ball and so forth. I, I, this is more of a, a, a network arrangement, much more interrelated and that, that, that we accept. This is why we use the field, um, the gravity field um, model uh, more than we you know, preferred any of the other models that we talked about. Uh, perhaps also the sort of the facilitation is more than the water that, uh, that helps the fish sort of move. Uh, move about um, perhaps you know internal intention the 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 seeing the uh, the, the 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 fisherman's uh, hook that that falls on the water and the fish runs away 
Um, so there are a number of uh, different um, different links, uh, to use your term, that are involved in here. We're, we're certainly aware of that. It's much more a, a networking in the way that uh, Professor Sheldrake also brought to our attention uh, and has been bringing to our attention that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that there's a whole lot of interlinked things that are going on. The tea that I'm drinking right now uh, can actually have an impact on um, the people who are picking tea leaves, um, in this case, you know, uh, Queensland in Australia or in Sri Lanka. So there is a, there's a, the, the causal process in the, in, the, in the universe is much more complicated and much more um, systematic uh, rather than sort of systemic in the old, old system of, of causality. So we, you know, we, we, we are quite, quite aware of that. It's just to sort of fill out all the dots is, is, is our challenge. Thank you. Um, it seems there's a question from uh, Naula Khaji in Mumbai. Uh, does Lesha deal with the psychic colors, Samji? Yes. Uh, Leshas, uh, especially, they are meant for creating psychic colors or aura behind, uh, around the body. So whatever emotions we are having, it is, having, it is because of our uh, um, rising of Mohani Karma which is inside. So leshas are created mostly uh, because of the rising of Mohaniya Karma and uh, they, they have six colors. So among the six colors, three are because of the rising of the Mohaniya Karma, especially the negative emotions. And uh, three colors represent that if the karma is subsided, then you get automatic some purity of your emotions. It means you, ha you have positive emotions. And because of the positive emotions, your thinking automatic becomes very positive. Your action becomes very positive. Your behavior becomes very positive. Your wordings become very positive. And your aura also becomes very positive, having very good colors. So the three colors represent your emotional inner in state of consciousness, purity or impurity. So, and they create the colors in our aura. So yes, uh, Lesha stands for color, coloring for psychic colors. And that right. is one, one, one book uh, which has been written by Acharya Shri Mahapragiji, which is a uh, Abha Mandal. And that has been translated into English also, transforming uh, inner transformations. So I would suggest to learn about uh, Lesha's, how it is affecting our consciousness, how it is affecting our behavior, how it plays great role in our spiritual evolution. That has been very beautifully uh, explained in that particular book. And there is one, another book, uh, Konsapat Chune, Chune Konsapat. So that book also very excellent to understand the concept of uh, Lesha and role, uh, and its role, important role in our personality, in our overall existence. So these books are very important to learn or read. This one uh, might be for you, Samiji, also from Bipin and Nita Shekht. Uh, yes. Are aliens same as our angels? Uh, aliens? Sorry. Are, are aliens same yes. as our angels? <laughs> okay, so whom this, she is uh, uh, talking about uh, as alien, first I have to learn about that, that concept of alien, <laughs> then con I, only I can answer. So I will uh, talk to her and understand first what she wants to know, and then I will explain to her. Yeah. Uh, there is one question by Acharya Kanaknandi. Uh, okay. That is... According to Darwin, Jim born as unicellular organism in water, and it further grew and became modern human. Is it true according to Jain philosophy? Okay, uh, Brianna will answer to this question. Brianna has left, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, actually, uh, I have to, uh, can you repeat the same question so that I can get the point actually? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, okay. According to Darwin, Jeev born as unicellular organism in water and okay. it further okay. growed and became modern human. Is it true according to Jain philosophy? Okay, so according to Jainis Jainism, it is not true. 
and if you have read the book uh, uh, jain darshan manan or mimansa in which acharya mahapragya ji has given uh, answer to darwinian theories from jain perspective he said that uh, darwin believes that it is the same species uh, which is uh, growing on and developing to higher state and that is not true it uh, all depends on the our karmas and uh, those who are uh, growing they are just not growing from the uh, one cellular to higher species or complex uh, body they are uh, also develop sometimes living beings are developing in the higher state or developed in high state they also can go to lower state because of their karmas so it is uh, not the individual development or evolution which narvin is saying and it is not acceptable in jainism there can be racial development some some of the living beings can be found in first era some out, species can be found in the second era and third era like this it can be possible because of the conducive environment the the living beings who are not born uh, by uh, what we say garbage uh, process they can be born in different times in different uh, environment and uh, whenever they get conducive environment but uh, it is not dependent on some uh, order that the same species is going on or growing with time no it is not accepted and with that time is up unless somebody has a very pressing question we can take one more but uh, it's midnight in india and uh, hands up thank you so much dr thank Jane. you all it was a wonderful evening and uh, dr akhtar thank you also for letting thank me thank you yeah jaya hind of course tomorrow is my speech. yes sir i am very much okay. thankful to dr kalyan gangawal because i have invited him in a very very short no notice he was so busy in his uh, uh, dealing with his patients even though he accepted at once my uh, proposal and i have come and has given wonderful talk and motivated all our delegates so we would like to listen to you again Uh, in a some seminar of doctors so that uh, you can have more time for discussion and uh, the delegates would have also get good ample time for asking their questions thank you very much to all the panelists thank you mr kumar thank you jai jinnad ji jai acharya kanaknand ji also giving blessings to all of you it was very nice uh, and blessings to all of you thank you thank you all so this concludes now the third day of the international conference on jain, uh, science and jain philosophy tomorrow will be our final day we'll start again at 7:30 in the morning eastern standard time 5 pm indian time thank you very much for joining and we will see you tomorrow jai jain and take care thank you jai jain jai jain jai jain to all jai jain jai jain to all thank you akmal jai jain to all vandan samne diya Well known to OG like a pair of shell toes, never mad, just motivated.